Gervasia. Thank you. All right, can y'all hear me okay? This mic is kind of funky. All right, well, good morning, everybody. I'm so happy that you are kicking off your Word Camp Weekend with me. Again, my name is Javasia Harris Bowser, and I am the founder of CJ and Write, a website and community for women who write and blog. I'm also a freelance journalist, a blogger, an essayist, a freelance content writer. I do a whole lot of writing all the time. So, um, this particular session is going to be great for anybody who is thinking about starting a blog, but you also want to write a book, and you're trying to figure out, well, how can I do both? Well, you can do both by blogging your book. It's also good for anyone who's already had a blog, it's been consistent, and now you want to turn that blog into a book, or maybe you have a blog, and it hasn't been all that consistent, we're going to talk about that too and how you can get back on track and then use that content to eventually start writing your book project. So here in Birmingham, a lot of folks used to call me the blogger girl because I, not only do I blog, but I like to help other folks start their blogs too. I've been blogging since 2008. I'm the creator of Blog Like Crazy, which is an annual challenge that encourages you to blog every day for 30 days. I've used blogging and social media to build a business. And as I mentioned, I'm also a freelance content writer and blogger for businesses, organizations, and public figures. So lots and lots of writing. However, have you ever heard that phrase, the cobbler's children have no shoes? You know, this idea that the cobbler is so busy making shoes for everybody else in town that his own children have no shoes. Well, a friend of mine used to use that phrase talking about me because I had helped all of these other women write and publish books, and I had never written and published one of my own. Now, I had essays featured in anthologies and literary journals and things like that, but never a whole book all my own because I was too busy helping everybody else with their book. And, you know, I was doing all this other writing. So I was like, I don't have time to write a book. How am I going to do that? And then another friend of mine, who's actually in this room, Catherine Lang, said to me one day, Dracia, you've probably written five books already because of all of the blogging you do. You can take your blog content and turn that into a book. And I was very resistant to that idea initially because I thought, well, who's going to buy a book when most of the content is already out there for free, right? But... I realized in that statement, I'm assuming that there is someone out there who's so obsessed with me that they've read every single thing I've ever put online. And trust me, there is no one, including my husband, <laughs> who has read every single thing I've put online. So that was not really something that I needed to be worried about. And so eventually I did write a book that was largely based on blog content and that book is Find Your Way Back, which is an essay collection about how I've used writing to get through everything in my life, including a cancer diagnosis. Now, my road to this book, though, was a rocky one, and we're going to cover that in the meat of today's presentation. But my blog did help me be able to complete this book. So why should you blog your book? Number one, blogging is going to help you develop discipline. You need discipline to blog consistently. You're also going to need discipline to write a book, and your blog is going to help you do that. Your blog is also going to help you build your author platform, and there are two parts of that platform, right? So there's one part is the audience. So your blog is going to help you build an audience of people that will buy your book when it's ready to go. It will also help you build authority on whatever the topic is that you're blogging about. So your blog is going to help you with all of that regarding your author platform. And blogging is actually going to help you test and refine your idea. So when I talk about blog your book, let's be clear. I'm not saying we're going to have a blog and then one day we're going to print out all the blog posts and slap them together and say, here's my book. No, that's not what we're doing, okay? But... As you're blogging, you're going to start discovering what really resonates with people. So my blog, CJ Wright, is all about 
teaching women how to use writing to make an impact and make an income. So I want them to make a difference, but also make some money. But along the way, what I learned was that a lot of that information that I was sharing, they could get that anywhere. The reason they were coming to me is because I was giving them inspiring stories. So yes, the instruction is good, but it needs to be wrapped in inspirational stories. And that is something that I learned through blogging. And so I applied that to my book. So these are the reasons why I think you should blog your book. So how are you going to do that? So first, you've got to nail down your niche. So whether you're starting a blog fresh or you're kind of pivoting the one you already have to go in this direction of eventually writing a book, you've got to nail down your niche. But also keep in mind that when it comes time to write your book, your niche may change a little bit. It may shift a little bit because what you're probably going to have to do is niche down even more, and that's okay. So how are you going to do that? How are you going to nail down your niche? So figure out what is the topic you want to write about. Why do you want to write about it? What specifically do you want to say about it? And who is this for? So as I mentioned, I write about writing, which is really meta, right? But that's what I do. I write about writing. Why do I do that? Why do I want to write about writing? Because I want all of you to be writers. I really, truly believe that storytellers change the world. I did a whole TED Talk on that. And I don't mean like I ranted on social media. I actually did a TED Talk on it. But <laughs> I believe that storytellers have the power to change the world. And so that's why I want everybody to be a writer. Especially, so to answer the question, who would I do this for? I especially want women to write. Now, I want everybody to write. So, fellas, I want you writing too. But I really, really want women to write because for so long we have been silenced. And so I want, I really, really want our voices out there. So what do I want to say? I want to say that with your writing, you have the power to change your life and the lives of the people around you. So you need to answer these questions for yourself. So food blog, okay, that's great. But what is it about food that you're trying to say? Who are you writing this for? What kind of food? Why are you so passionate about food? You've got to figure all of this out to nail down your niche. All right, pro tip here, book proposals. I believe that even if you are planning to self-publish, you should write a book proposal. And your blog will help you do that. And if you haven't started your blog, your book proposal can help you start your blog. So what does that look like? So when you write your book proposal, that book overview becomes your blog's about page. Your book marketing plan, that becomes your promotion plan for your blog. Your list of chapters, those are blog post ideas. Your sample chapters, that's your first batch of blog posts. And then complementary titles, so if there are authors, so you look at your list of complementary titles, and that's books that are similar to yours, and look at those authors and see if they have a blog. If they do, try to guest post for that blog so that you can start connecting with their audience because their audience is going to most likely be interested in what you're writing about. And even if they don't have a blog, see if there's some other way that you could collaborate. Maybe you could go, you could do an IG Live together or something like that. Now, this is, if you don't have a blog yet or you're revamping your blog, take your book proposal, use it to kickstart your blog. You can also reverse this. So if you've already got the blog, you've been consistent, and now you're ready to go from blog to book, use your blog to write your book proposal. So your blog's about page, that becomes your book overview. Your blog promo plan, so all the things that you've been doing to promote your blog post, you can do those same things to promote your book. And your strongest blog posts can become your sample chapters. So I actually did this. So even though I self-published my book, I wrote a book proposal, and I did this to write it. 
And so I wrote the proposal because initially I was going to use a hybrid publisher. And if you're not familiar with hybrid publishing, it's what it sounds like. It's a hybrid between self and traditional. And so most hybrids, you have to have a book proposal. I ended up not going with that company, but I had a proposal and I used that proposal to apply for a grant, which I won, and then I used that money to fund my self-publishing. So I highly recommend writing a proposal, even if you're gonna self-publish, because you can use it to win a grant and get some money, and we all need some money, right? All right, so here's a great way how your blog can help you with that proposal. All right, so you nail down your niche, now you gotta plan your process. If you have a blog and you aren't consistent, it is not because you're lazy. Well, I mean, I don't know you. Maybe you are lazy, but I doubt it, right? <laughs> I don't think you would be here if you were lazy. If you are not consistent, it's probably because you haven't planned your process. So to stay consistent, you gotta stay ahead. And the only way to do that is to have a process. You've gotta have two things an editorial calendar, and an editorial process. Now, most folks have an editorial calendar, but that's all they have. But we're going to talk about both. All right, an editorial calendar is not complicated at all. It's just what you want to post, when you want to post it. That's it. That's all an editorial calendar is. So you brainstorm your blog post ideas and your social media ideas and you create your editorial calendar by deciding when you're going to post or publish these different ideas. But be flexible. So typically what I do is I'll plan out my content ideas for the month ahead. But then every Sunday, I'll kind of look at what I have planned for the week and I'll make adjustments as needed. So be flexible because, you know, life happens, things happen in the news and things like that. Now, editorial calendar great. Most people do this, right? They plan out, okay, I'm going to post this that day and this that day. And they're like, yeah, I got this. And then nothing happens. Because you can't stop there. Like, yes, your editorial calendar is all cute. But when are you going to actually do this stuff? You got to plan that. You've got to have an editorial process. So you break down your steps. You've got to brainstorm. You've got to research an outline. Then you actually got to write it. You need to select images, video, you've got to edit and format, and then you publish and promote it. So this is your process, and you've got to schedule when you're going to do each and every step. Now, if possible, it's great to batch produce content. So let's say you want to publish a new blog post every week. Then what you could do is take a weekend to just write all four blog posts, create all that social media content, just knock it all out in a weekend, okay? And so you do, you write your four posts, you create your, uh, your social media content to promote those posts, you got it all set. Now, if you know that your life is just not set up like that, and there is no way you can take a whole weekend to work on content, then that means you're gonna have to drip this process out throughout the week. And what does that look like? So you could research an outline on Monday, write on Tuesday, Wednesday you choose your images and videos, Thursday you format and edit, and then schedule when it's going to publish, then Friday you work on those social media posts. Now this does mean that you're working on your blog a little bit every day, but if you do this, you shouldn't get overwhelmed because you're not trying to do all of these steps on one day, okay? So I'm just trying to help you be consistent here. And what you will find is that once you have developed this process of creating your blog content, that discipline or devotion, if you don't like the word discipline, is going to help you when it's time to write your book because you're already in this groove of working on your content on a regular basis. All right. Now, I'm going to briefly talk about SEO very, very briefly, because I hate talking about SEO, and there's a whole workshop on it tomorrow that y'all can go to, but um, don't completely ignore SEO, all right? And we writer types, 
we don't really like thinking about SEO because we just want to be creative. But you need to think about SEO because you're trying to build an audience, right? Because you need some folks to buy this book once you write it. So you're trying to build an audience and getting their organic traffic is a great way to do that. So here are some very basic SEO tips for writers. So first of all, do your keyword research. So this means basically just see if people are actually searching for whatever the topic is that you're planning to write about and what kinds of questions are they asking about that topic. So you can find this out through uh, some rush through answer the public also through Google so Google trends but also just searching the topic on Google and Google will tell you people have also asked or searched for and you can use those suggestions in your blog post so for example uh, artist date I don't know if you know what an artist date is but if you've ever read Julia Cameron's the artist way she talks about taking yourself out on an artist date every week and so let's say you're going to write a blog post on artist dates. So you want to do a post of 52 artist date ideas. So you'll have an idea for every week of the year. So you Google artist date and you'll see that folks are asking, what is an artist date? How do you take an artist date? And so you can use that to inform your blog post. So you do your keyword research. You make sure you're using your keywords in your title, your subtitle, and sparingly throughout your post. You don't want to use it too much because that's called keyword stuffing. Google doesn't like that. So um, use it sparingly. Make sure you're including images, high quality links, so that's internal links, but also external links to websites that are reputable and relevant. And Google prefers long in-depth posts because typically when people want to read something, they want something more in-depth. If it's something short and quick, they're just going to go to a video. So that's why Google likes those longer posts. However, humans don't, <laughs> right? Because humans have no attention span. So you have to trick them into reading it. And so you do that with your subheads, with images, throw in the video if you need to. But what I always tell people when we talk about SEO is I go over these rules and then I say, when you're writing, forget all of this. Don't think about any of this when you're writing. Because when you're writing, you need to write for a human, not an algorithm. So when you're writing, just write. Then on your formatting day, your editing and formatting day, you can go back and think about all of this stuff, like am I using my keywords properly? Do I have, are my images titled properly? Blah, 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 okay? You can think about all of that after you've written the post. If you use WordPress, which Obviously you do. If you're here, the Yoast SEO plugin can help you out with this as well. Okay, that's it about SEO because I hate talking about it. All right, build your blog community. So you want to build a community again because you need folks that are going to read that book when you write it. So how do you do that? Social media is a great way to do that. You can also do that through email and text communities as well. I have all of these. So I do social media. I have an email list and I have a text community. But you need to really know your ideal reader. So many beginner bloggers, they say, oh, I want to write for everybody. No, no, don't do that. Don't do that. So when you try to write for everybody, you end up writing for nobody, right? <laughs> so don't do that. Know your ideal reader. And even create an ideal reader avatar, give that person a name, and think about that person when you are writing your post. And so it helps to know your ideal reader because you need to know what is the biggest problem or the biggest obstacle keeping that reader from doing the thing you want them to do. So whatever your niche is. So if it is food, like I used earlier, are you trying to get your ideal reader to cook more, cook healthy meals? What's standing in their way from doing that? Well, figure that out, and then you need to offer them something free that's going to help them very quickly with that problem. So for me, my ideal reader, usually there are two things. One, time. They always say, I don't have time to write. I don't have time to write. I don't have time to write. So... I have this quick and easy 
free e-course that's a time management e-course. Another thing that a lot of my ideal readers struggle with is um, they don't know where to start. A lot of women who want writing careers, they say, I don't know where to even begin. So I have a quick and easy free e-course that's seven ways to jumpstart your writing career. So, But you can't create that if you don't know your ideal reader. Sorry, I should just go on here. Okay, so you create that, and that will get them to sign up for your email list. You can build a text community, too, as I mentioned. And then we have social media. So you want to make sure you use all parts of the pig if you are a vegetarian and this offends you. I am sorry. Um, so in uh, journalism, I mentioned I'm a freelance journalist, and I have two degrees in journalism because I just couldn't get enough, I guess. Um, so in journalism, we use this phrase, use all parts of the pig, talking about stories, right? So you have one story idea, and you can turn it into several different articles. In blogger world, we use this to talk about taking that blog post and then turning it into all of the social media content ideas. So you can take compelling quotes from your, um, from your posts and turn that into tweets. You can use any images on Instagram or Pinterest. You can take out those powerful passages and put them on Facebook. If there are any questions that you're posing in your posts, you can use those in, sorry, I don't know why this is doing that. You can use those to spark conversation in Facebook groups. You could even go live on Facebook or Instagram and have a discussion about maybe like three points that you're making in your posts and then tease folks to go to the post to read the rest of them. Um, and so and you can do that with Reels as well, or in TikTok if, if you do that. So these are ways that you can take your blog content and then um, turn it into blog posts. And again, you're doing all of this because you're building community, because you're trying to get folks to be invested so when that book comes out, they're ready to buy. Okay? So now, you've built your blog. You've been consistent because you've been planning your process. You've been promoting your blog, so you've built a community. So now it's time to write that book. So how do we go from blog to book? First, you've got to choose the focus of your book. Now you're like, well, I know the focus because I already have the niche for my blog. No, you're going to have to niche down even more. So I mentioned that my road to my book was a rocky one. So I actually wrote the first version of my book in 2017 and did nothing with it because it wasn't very good. And at first I couldn't figure out why it wasn't good. And then one day I, went, I was going for a walk with my husband and he said, you know, I've been telling people that you're writing a book and they asked me, what's the book about? And I realized I can't tell them because I don't know. Like, what's your elevator pitch? And I was like, say what now? <laughs> What's my what? And I realized my book wasn't very good because it was all over the place. It was not focused. And, and I thought it was because I was like, oh, it's about writing. That's a focus. No, it's not. That's way too broad. I didn't have an, he didn't have an elevator pitch because I didn't have an elevator pitch. And I didn't have one because my book was not focused. It was all over the place. So even though you have this broad topic, you're still going to have to niche down some more for your book. And I was like, I don't have time to do this. So I just put it on a shelf. And I didn't do anything with it. Then 2020 happened. And 2020 was awful for all of us, right? Uh, it was extra awful for me um, because January 24th, 2020, I was diagnosed with stage two breast cancer. And that changed everything, including my writing. And so I wrote my way through cancer and through that also figured out what the focus of my book needed to be. And so Find Your Way Back, my book, is about how to write your way through anything, even cancer. And so I then had my focus. So it wasn't just about writing 
and why writing is great and how to build a writing career. But no, it was about how writing can get you through anything, even a cancer diagnosis. So your think about what your subtitle for your book is going to be. That'll help you figure out your focus and, and have an elevator pitch. If you had to talk about your book in 30 seconds, what would you say? All right, so you got your focus. Now that you have your focus, go to your blog, because remember, we are not printing out all of our blog posts and slapping them together. Nobody wants to read that, okay? Nobody wants to read that. So you have your focus. Now go back to your blog, and you're pulling out your best post related to that focus, okay? And then you revise and you rewrite as needed. Because remember, as you've been blogging, you've been learning about what really resonates with people. And I told you that I learned that what really resonated with my readers were inspirational stories. So it wasn't enough just to give them tips and instruction. They wanted the inspiration. So when I pulled my best blog posts, when I was rewriting and revising, what I was doing was fleshing out those stories and adding more stories because I had learned over the years that that's what people really wanted. So then you've got to bridge the gap. So even though your, even though this is like a collection of blog posts, basically, or a collection of essays, that's essentially what your book is going to be if you're blogging your book. You still, there still needs to be a story arc, like an overall story arc or narrative of your book. That still needs to be there. The reader still needs to feel a sense of that. And so you figure out what that story arc is, and then you fill in any gaps so that it will be connected and it'll feel cohesive and it'll feel like that story arc. And then you put it all together. And you ask yourself, is there anything else I could add that would really make my book stand out? And for me, I did this at the last minute, y'all. My book was completely done. I was about to, like, send it off to, because I hired, I was, because of that grant, I was able to hire a team to help me with all the logistics of publishing. And I was about to just send it off to them. And then I thought, there's something missing. This needs something else. I'm trying to convince people that they can write their way through anything. And I'm giving them these stories, yes, but I need to give them something else. Writing prompts. So at the last minute, I realized that I needed to add writing prompts to my book. And so I went through and added them throughout. So once you put it all together, allow yourself time to take a step back and see, is there something else that my book is missing? Something I could add that would really just take it up to that next level. All right, so I want to, we have at least some time for questions. Before we go to that, um, so this is a QR code that may or may not work. So <laughs> sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. But this is a, a QR code that will take you to, yay. Okay, so this will take you to the CJ and Wright Network Facebook group, a uh, totally free group where you can hang out with other writers. We'll encourage you, and we also ask silly questions sometimes too. So, yeah, just come hang out with us. And um, if you join the group, you'll also see... Uh, notifications about a workshop that I'm having on Galentine's Day. So February 13th at 6.30 p.m. Central Time, I'm having a journaling workshop, totally free, it's virtual. And so if you like to journal or you want to get into journaling, I would love for you to join us and you can get info about that in the group. If you are not on the book, then you can just email me or send me a DM via um, Instagram and I will send you the link to get registered for the workshop. All right, are there any questions? So thank you so much for that presentation. And I have a microphone, and if you have a question, I'm going to bring it to you so that our recording and the captioner can get it. Can you give us a little information, insight into putting it together with your team, cost, uh, who they were? 
what they did and did not do, what you yes. were, what you had to do yourself, mm -hmm. and um, advantages between uh, hybrid publishing and the sole publishing. Okay, those are great questions. Okay, um, I will start with the last question because that's the easiest one <laughs> to answer. So hybrid publishing, if, in case you're not familiar with it, is what it sounds like. It's a hybrid between self and traditional. So with traditional publishing, you know, you get a book contract and you don't have to pay for anything. They handle everything for you. With self-publishing, you are paying for everything. You are doing everything. Um, so a hybrid is a hybrid of the two in that you have a team of people who will handle everything for you, but you're paying for it. So that's what a hybrid is, okay? And it's very expensive, typically, if you get a good company. So um, the advantages of self versus hybrid is obviously that they do all of these things for you. And if you have a really strong company, they usually even have the ability to get your book placed in bookstores nationwide as well, which is very, very difficult to do if you self-publish. So again, a huge advantage for hybrid over self is that hybrid, they're going to cover everything. You're going to get in bookstores, most likely. Um, the disadvantage is just money, right? <laughs> it's very expensive, and they get a cut of your sales. If you self-publish, yeah, it's a lot of work because you got to do everything, but you also get all the money, right? So that's the answer to your second question. Your first question about the cost is really going to vary depending on what you're, who you're going with. But so for my team... Um, my team costs 6500 so I paid 6500 for the package that I purchased from my team, and they did pretty much everything. So they designed the cover, they laid out the book, they uploaded it to Amazon, they created like a press packet for me and all of this stuff. Um, I still hired an editor in addition to that, because they don't really do that. They do like light editing, but I wanted a professional editor. So I did hire a professional editor um, in addition to that. I can't remember how much that cost. I can't remember, but it wasn't cheap because she's good. <laughs> so hopefully that answered your question. Recommendations as to software packages? I, I didn't do that part. Because my team did that. So, oh, you mean just typing it? You can do that anyway. I mean, a lot of people are very big on Scrivener. So, if that's your thing, if you think that's going to help you, I would say do that. Uh, I'm not, what, I can write, if you just hand me like this, I will write a book on it. Like, I don't, it doesn't matter for me. I use, I mean, my team and I, we use Google Drive and Google Docs just because that's easy to communicate that way. But as far as like how I actually wrote the book, that was kind of all over the place. So, But we use Google Drive to put everything together. Other questions? Thanks for all the great information. I'm just curious, when you wrote your book or when you're helping other people through your talks like this, do people write their books mainly for notoriety, they want the sales, they just want to be positioned as the expert. What have you found mm -hmm. most people are writing for? Is it for their own self? Yeah, most of the people that I work with, they are writing just because they've always wanted a book, right? They've been writing all their lives and they just want to know that, yes, I can write a book. I do, I have worked with um, business owners who are writing so that they can position themselves as an expert on a certain topic. And so for them, that's their goal. But a lot of the people that I work with, they just want to finally write a book because it's something that they've wanted to do their entire lives. Demetrius, did you have anything else? Uh, one second. Thanks for the, like you said, great information. So uh, just I wanted to know, how do you build a community when you feel like your niche or your niche is just you? Because mm -hmm. it's just like, like you said, some people have only just, they've always wanted to write a book. In my case, I feel like 
I'm just writing my dream journal. So how mm -hmm. do I build a community around that? Because whatever it is that you're doing, you're not the only person doing it, right? So for you, you could build a community around um, other folks who journal. Mm -hmm. You could even get as specific as dream journals, but you could start with, if you wanted to, you could just start with like building a community of folks who love to journal. Um, it I think it would be really cool to have a, a men's community uh, a, a group of men who journal because you know I just don't hear men talk about journaling that much and I think that would be really cool but um but yeah that's what I would do I would kind of take whatever your interest is and build a community around that so you feel like it's just you but it's not right. other folks have the same interest so just take that and build a community around that I okay. hope that makes sense well can I ask a second question of course so um so would the community, would there need to be blog posts on the blog pertaining to the community or how does it that, can do be? I mean, that? that's totally up to you. So I do. So on CJ and Wright, there are, you know, instructional posts, there are inspiring posts. And then, yes, there are posts sometimes highlighting people who are a part of the community. So I do this thing where it's like a member of the month. And so I'm highlighting someone in the community. So, yes, you can do that as well. You don't have to, but but yes, you can. Okay. So wonderful again. I've been in other talks of yours that are Thank always you. full of inf great information. So my question is kind of piggybacking on that. How do we, did you or how do you encourage someone who's blogging who feels like I'm just I'm just writing? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, no one. I, you know, and I what I've learned is that people don't always comment. Right. So right. later on, someone will say, "I read your blog post," and I'm like. Man, it'd be great if you had said something. Yeah. Because <laughs> after a while, you feel like no one's listening. Yeah. So how did you go to get through that? That's why social media is so important. I know social media can be annoying, <laughs> and it can be a time suck, but it is really such a great way to build community because people usually do not comment on blog posts, but they will comment on a social media post. And so I feel like that's why it's just, such a great thing. So I've done that primarily through a Facebook group, the, the one that we had the QR code for. So because people who read my blog will read the blog, but then go to the Facebook group to talk about it. So a lot of people do that. So social media can be a great way to start building that community. It doesn't have to be a Facebook group. Um, you know, there are other ways that you can do it. But that's what I would do. Um, CJ and Wright also started out as a Birmingham-based community. So it actually started with events. So we were actually having in-person events, but then uh, it just grew. And so now we have members all over the country and even in different countries. And so now we focus mostly on social media and on Zoom for our community. But um, the key is you're, you're probably going to have to go beyond the blog to build a community and to spark the conversation just because that's how humans roll these days. So I hope that's helpful. Oh, Actually, sorry. I had at least two questions. So the first one is, um, is there a particular time when you were talking about your editorial uh, process and, mm -hmm. and your uh, calendar, is there a particular time when you schedule publishing and those social media posts or mm -hmm. like in terms of, for your analytics to be better. Right. Cause yeah, I mean, that's going to depend on everybody. And so and you just said what you need to do. You need to look at your analytics and see what is working. So it's trial and error, right? So you test out, okay, I'm going to do these social posts on these days at this time. See how that's working. Are people responding? Are people interacting with it? If they're not, then let's try something else. So, So, yeah, there's no, like, one and done answer to start off like when you have no analytics you can just do a google search when's the best time to post on facebook all right you can just do that and start with that recommendation in the beginning because you have nothing else to go on and then you just play around with it from there okay great thank you and the other question i had about your blog is a lot of times when i see people doing those it gets kind of annoying because as you're scrolling down through it, there's ad after ad after ad, and then you can't really find what the content was, and 
then you just kind of like whatever and leave it. Well, I don't have ads on my blog, so you if you're okay. going to ask about that, That's, I, that I don't was have my a question. Is okay, yeah, I don't have ads on my blog. So. Okay, uh, great. Thank you so much. Hey, hey. CJ, first right? of Remember? all, I want to say, <laughs> not only did she write her way through cancer, but she got a lot of other women writing through her cancer um, diagnosis and just a big inspiration. So thank you. Thank you. Um, it's like, my question is, as you know, I've been trying to write a book proposal for about two years, and this is, was very helpful. Do you have any resources for going through a more established blog and looking for the posts that that you call like most engaging, most important, mm -hmm. other than numbers and comments, like what else are you looking for to say like this is the blog post? Um, so along with comments, I mean, just really your analytics. So is there um, the blog posts that people were reading, but also that people were sharing? So I have one blog post on my blog that mm -hmm. gets about 50,000 views a year. Mm -hmm. It's been doing that consistently for like years, like five years. And then all my other blog posts. <laughs> okay. So that's why so, I'm asking that question. So that post, the, the, the magical post, is it related to the book proposal that you've been trying to write? I feel like everything I do is related, but it's on the peripheral for sure. Okay. So it's not, it's not the book you want to write? No, because I want to write a DEI book. It's about a court case. So it's a DEI, but it's not the DEI. You know what I mean? Okay. Um, but it sounds like, do you think people are drawn to that because of the story? Mm -hmm. So I think maybe that's the key. So even if you don't use that particular court case, maybe what it's showing you is that this DEI book that you are going to write, it needs to be rooted in stories. So not mm -hmm. just like, here's your DEI manual, exactly. but it needs to be rooted in compelling and stories. And it could be used like, as like an example or something. Yeah, you can okay, definitely gotcha. use it in there. Gotcha. Yeah. One more question. It's okay. Um, so I'm a biologist and in my professional life, and so we're always really cautious about sharing our manuscripts with other people because then they can scoop you. Is this something that you really worry about, like in this nonfiction genre? I'm assuming probably not. Like you. No, I feel. In fact, I feel like it's less of an issue with the nonfiction because, especially if you're telling your own story, because like. How, how are you going to steal my cancer story, right? <laughs> like, that's not really possible. So, um, so, no, I don't really worry about that that much. Now, that said, I wouldn't just go around, like, handing my manuscript out to a bunch of strangers. That's why it's so important to find a writing community and have that group of people that you do trust. And so if you are going to have beta readers, um, for whatever you're working on, you need to make sure that those beta readers are people that you really trust. And if you are super worried about it, you can even have them sign a contract beforehand. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Javasia, for a great presentation. We'll be back in this room.